Hi John, my name is Alexi, Alexi Dakea, I'm working for Arista. And uh, it's actually going to to present you the, uh, some of the uh, high bandwidth uh, consuming applications. Uh, how to handle them in a um, new modern design data center, the considerations for that. So first, in terms of high bandwidth consumption, you've got several applications that you probably all know of. You've got the IP storage. You've got more and more nowadays clustered applications. Now, rather than having servers communicating one to one, uh, one to one, your application is being more and more distributed. Adobe is one of the examples. But as the, uh, the enterprise, the service providers, portals are all moving to some form of distribution, then the application, the traffic, is all moving across the data center. There's more and more load on your uh, network infrastructure. In terms of load increase, this example here is about IP storage. This is using servers, 40 gig mix, network adapters, used for storage. So you see 6 petabytes of data across storages with a uh, 40 gig mix each. And that, net, that, that, that storage based on kind of standard servers. This is not a storage array, this is servers with 40 gig mix using GPFS. Distributed storage. So that customer, for example, has been driving over 90% utilization. You can see 39.5 gigabits per second of traffic per day. That's a cumulative bandwidth of over 316 gigabits per second. So nowadays, the servers don't have in themselves bottleneck anymore to drive bandwidth. The NICs, the PCI bus, the CPU, all that is driving the performance very high. And the bottleneck today in the data center is more likely to be the network. As an example, when all that high bandwidth application is crossing the network, <coughs> what we should talk about is about that buffer here. In this example, you've got different flows coming from different interfaces. As seen in the previous example, you've got different storages, sending traffic to some clients, or clients storing data, accessing the storage. Then, what could happen is that when the traffic is relatively smooth, everything gets um, absorbed by the buffer. You always use buffer. The uh, the traffic that's relatively smooth has some little burst. Traffic is coming by, by a gentle burst. And most of the buffers can cope with that. In this example, we are using 80% utilization link. This is a graph representing we are sending traffic at 80% line rate on a 10 gigabit space, for example. Buffer is fine. Traffic is coming by by agent bus. However, what you have to consider is congestion in your network. And that's going to have a huge impact the way you understand your uh, you need to understand your application because that has got a high impact. While traditionally server to server communication could have been fine and it had a minimal or no impact at all on your application, the fact that nowadays the traffic is being distributed across all your platform in a mesh manner, then it means you would have often traffic converging to, uh, towards a few amount of cost. In this example, when, when this interface here is receiving two packets, not two packets can go out of the interface at the same time. When we go first, we're being serialized out of the interface while the other packet is waiting. And that, that gets even worse as the, um, as the amount of flow is going in, as in an in cast or fan in, or as the bandwidth here is much greater than the address interface. So this is just an illustration of congestion. This is happening when, here a typical example, a client, a compute server, is requesting some data from some distributed server for uh, distributed storage. It sends a request at 1 gig or 10 gig, and all the servers here, storage servers for distributed, which could be different arrays, are going to all reply to that request of the file with they are 10 gig or 40 gig, all at once sending that 
to the client. That means here we are receiving a huge amount of bandwidth. Whether it's coming from a single server with a higher amount of bandwidth than this one, or over 10 gig, you've got potentially 40 gig of traffic coming by bus and it needs to be serialized out of that 10 gig interface. So the more distributed the application is, and the more likely you are to suffer from uh, buffer congestion. One of the problems in buffer congestion is once you exceed your buffer size, you are suffering drops. Drops mean packet being lost, and that has got an impact on the traffic, on the end-to-end -end, uh, application, including CCP. This is an example of a good put performance in the network with a relatively shallow buffer and the amount of session increasing, the amount of nodes in the network. But what is good put? It doesn't mean the throughput is low, because you might still be sending you know, 600 uh, megs on one gig or 6 gig of traffic on 10 gig. Gigs. This is just the fact that you've got more and more retransmissions. Good put is different from throughput. The good put is the amount of useful data used by the application, not lost in retransmit. Example here. We've got a set buffer. We still send 80% utilization on the link. So we still send 8 gig of traffic towards that port. Same port, same buffer. But the traffic profile has changed a little bit. This is a more, to present a more stressful application with more, um, with, with more burst. You can see that the shape of the traffic we are sending is still at 80% utilization, but by burst. In more, uh, it's more bursting in shorter period of time. While well, previously, the spread of the bandwidth was more regular. Well, previous one was rep representing a relatively gentle traffic. Here, it represents a very bursty traffic. And what happens is that because of that burst, is concentrated in the period of time. However, the egress interface keeps serializing at the same speed. You can't keep up, and some of the some of the packets are being dropped on the buffer. The cause of those drops are in TCP, you all know about the uh, TCP uh, the back off when cell drops and it takes time to, to resort to the previous states to increase again and the point is that how much time do you think it takes for the TCP to realize that the packets are dropped? Some applications have got ways to, to Track of the TCP session, some others don't. I look for example. And the packet can be lost, it's got no idea it waits for the TCP um, session to turn out. It takes seconds or even more. And the part is that when you start suffering drops, the TCP windows, the TCP sizes um, start to synchronize, meaning your whole data center <coughs> will have synchronized TCP window have any flows started later because when you start to have drops it all falls in a synchronized manner. All the drops happen at the same time and that's got an impact latency at a large scale that's got a severe impact on your customer perception in your network. Another part the problem in the, in the drops is that they are usually very unfair. Here what you see on the uh, light blue is the spread of the amount of traffic received by different TCP flows. Some TCP flows receive an average of throughput. Some get a very good throughput. And you've got some part that receive a very poor amount of throughput. Some TCP flows don't receive anything. You've got flows that are working perfectly fine in your network, and some of the TCP flows that you don't understand what's happening because they don't receive any throughput. This TCP flow doesn't work. It's a bit random and it's unfair. With preserved um, with, it, with, with no drop at all, all those flows will be uh, providing some amount of, of, uh, of throughput. And this is the purpose of the buffering. The buffering is there to accommodate big bursts in the network. This example, you've got you know, the same bursty, uh, very stressful traffic for your uh, for the network with large buffers. The egress interface still receives, again, except for the all three cases, it's always 80% utilization. The first one was gentle traffic. The egress interface was able to keep up with the, uh, the serialization and the buffering as the, the traffic was spreading gently. Here, it's coming by big bursts. The 
pretty scale, the buffer was shallow, you couldn't keep up with a large amount of traffic coming by bus. In this case, the buffer is large enough and you can cope with the, um, with the, bus, with the, with the dustiness of the traffic. So, one question can be raised is, hey, the first is important, how much, how much do I need in the network? And the, the point was, is your traffic busy? Or is it very gentle? Some applications such as Hadoop, virtualization, you know those traffic that cross your network all over the place and it's difficult to, uh, to, to predict the traffic pattern. But as the cloud comes and as, as you go, the traffic is being more and more distributed, then you have to, um, to think about more and more about the traffic pattern in your application. Find in, in cast, has got impact on the buffer. In this example, we talked about the impact of other subscription on the, um, on, on the congestion. We got an example with four uplinks. This is a uh, kind of test, provides another subscription of four to one. And a second case with only three uplinks. So 5.3 to one is worse than four, four to one, obviously. And that goes more packet loss in the shadow buffer as you create more congestion onto that uplink. However, you can also sort of now, you can see the number with a large buffer, in this case 48 megs, you don't have any packet loss. Again, we retrieve the previous, um, the previous case where the link utilization might be just 60%, 80%, you don't reach 100%, but because the traffic comes by burst, the other subscription ratio creates even a bigger burst towards like a fennel. But the amount of buffer has an impact on its capacity to absorb those bursts. The bigger the other subscription ratio, the more likely the stress would be on the buffer. If your traffic is not busty at all, and you're the, you're the one to know about your, uh, your, your traffic profile, or you need to, to find out, you're unlikely to need big buffers. If you don't have any other subscription ratio, you are unlikely to suffer from uh, buffer stress. However, the more stressful your network, your traffic will be on your buffer, then the more useful the big buffer will be. And this is an, um, a use case with uh, the device here. The MSS and is a device with 125 megabytes of buffer to a port. Most of the Sorry, I tried to not get too into the test. Most of the network devices in the industry have got about 9 gigabytes of buffer per network processor. That's for the whole C4 port. That's for the whole AQs. That's just one few hundred kilobytes per port. This is where the red line is. That's for those network devices, most of what is present in the industry. And the graph represents what a customer with the 7500, for example, has actually read of the buffer utilization. It shows it exceeds one of the, reaches one of the uh, values it was recording it. So you see that about, this is the percentile, so roughly 75% of the devices have suffered a burst on their packet buffer over the, um, the, the, uh, the two nights here represented for this device. And none of the other products in the industry do provide um, more, more buffer, none of them to that scale. So this means everything that in blue here could have been dropped, could have been represented by the drop. So this is actual data, this is what is being actually used. <coughs> Those are you know, some verticals that are you know, using a lot of um, high performance application with its HPC, um, some IP clusters, virtualization. The same application within one of your network being used in your network, and this exactly the same application could be used in another network and might have different traffic profile. So this is really an overall idea, but it varies from one, one network to the other. From your application in someone else's network might behave differently. The idea is how nice would it be to have a visibility on the network? Because again, the, 
the stress on your buffer is, doesn't, is not present everywhere. You remember the fan in I was talking about? That's about, for example, distributed storage. So all the traffic, maybe storing data to your storage, if it's in a single rack, that device receiving all the traffic might suffer much more congestion than those that don't receive much. This is the fan in effect. Those devices are, have the buffers, more stressed than others. So having visibility is important. The, ma the, the manner you gain visibility from your buffer is also important. There's the polling base and there's the trigger base. Polling, you know, you can use the SNMP every minute. How likely are you to catch a burst of a few packets that can last just microseconds? This is a microburst. You can drop packets, you can feed your buffer in just a few microseconds. So even if you pull every second, you might want well to lose 30 million packets. So you don't have visibility. So having a trigger-based mechanism hardware support, not just some polling gimmicks, but it give you a great visibility on your buffer. So all those I mean, bandwidth angry applications, the, the buffer has got an impact, understanding the traffic profile and how your traffic behaves with the, uh, with the buffering, but there is a big, a big driver, 400 gig. Not everywhere, but think about those 10 gig links. You know, now the servers are coming to 40 gig, and what do you get for the upgrade? Well, there's another gig coming. And the most important point is, just like you could think of the 10 gig adoption, the 10 gig adoption really started when it became affordable, as affordable as 10 links of 1 gig, you know, rather than having servers with 8 links or, uh, or, or, or 10 links. Then today, the 100 gig is going becoming as affordable, or is, for example, with the 7500, um, for, for the data center where 100 gig ports become um, as affordable as 10 times 10 gig. The use cases are obviously when you've got a high bandwidth of 10 gig or when you've got 40 gig to the, to the top of frac switch and you need some uplinks. Could be 100 gig. Yeah, you can use multiple 40 gig, but then you've got you know, hashing consideration and there are so many 40 gig ports you could have. 100 gig can also be used between different silos of like data centers, storage, compute, or across but across different locations, where you've got your 100 links, you might want to, to increase that in an affordable manner. This device, for example, has got, um, it's got 96 um, 10 gig port. It offers short range, it offers long range. This device here is just some, um, some 100 gig, but this is the uh, what brings the affordability to the 100 gig today by including the transceiver on board the device itself. Rather than having your pluggables that are expensive, I don't know if some of you, some of you have 100 gig on your, uh, on, on your backbone, but think about how much it costs to have your 100 gig port. Those here are the price of roughly 10 ports of 10 gig, each of the 100 100 port doesn't cost the price of a house here. We also have the, the um, CFP2. So I'm going to talk about those new uh, transceivers. CFP2, the CFP was roughly the size of a work, CFP2 is more the size of a, uh, a transceiver, and the QSFP. QSFP100 <coughs> that support both 40 gig and 100 gig. 100 gig is on the top of fracks now. Yeah with 100 gig uplinks, where you needed, you, know, you needed more bandwidth, you need more buffer. This is a picture of the CFP2 on the uh, top right, and the QSFP100. This is exactly the same form factor of the QSFP40 gig, but simply with um, MPP24, or for, for, for the short range, or um, still um, LC for the, uh, for the long reach. So the use case of 100 gig in service provider environment is inside a data center for you know, high density, affordable 100 gig, high performance, or in a smaller manner with you know, 100 gig interconnect between sites and having a high density of 10 gig directly from, from a single device. Now, I want you to talk also about 
we've seen 10 gig, 100 gig, and we have some new Ethernet speeds coming. So the 25 gig and 150 gig Ethernet consortium was uh, founded by uh, Aristar.com, Google, Linux, and uh, Microsoft to bring new affordable high speed. It's all about cost per bandwidth. 25 gig is aiming at providing better bandwidth, cheaper than what the 10 gig can today. And the 50 gig is destined at, um, at providing something better than the 40 gig. Let me explain. 1 gig you know, is using one lane. Whether it's uh, the optical, it's using one pair of fiber. 10 gig as well. However, the 40 gig is using four lanes of 10 gig. You know, in the PCB, you've got four channels of 10 gig. That's why you've got MTP uh, or you know four lambdas in the, uh, the long reach of 40 gig, and 100 gig using four lanes of 25 gig. Now, with 25 gig and 50 gig, with the new technology allowing now more affordable um, technology, 25 gig makes it very efficient to have more bandwidth. So now, one with a single lane, you reach 25 gig, so 2.5 times more than 10 gig. However, the price cost is not 2.5, it's just slightly above the 10 gig. That makes it the best price performance ratio compared to 10 gig. 50 gig with two lights is also much less complex. Each CLS, CLS is standing for uh, serialization, uh, the serialization, is including in the um, in the chip, the board is also less complex. With more advanced CLS of 25 gig, it's possible to have more affordable, less power hungry, uh, consuming less space. So now you've got 25 gig that takes the space of a NSFP plus transceiver. You've got 50 gig that takes the space of a QSFP. So you get more bandwidth per space, you've got high density product that provides you speeds at say a lower price point per um, but more bandwidth for the for the money. This is the level of 25 gig. This is providing roughly a um, an improvement of two and a half on the bandwidth, but it's just 1.5x on the cost. So when network is your business really those bandwidth um, make sense. And those are being driven by very large customers that are, that are driving the whole, the whole industry. <coughs> and those technologies are not just you know, vaporware or what. Broadcom has just released the, uh, the chip last week, supporting 25 gig and 50 gig, up to 32 ports, 100 gig, 64 ports of 40 gig, 50 gig. So all that brings is very high performance, very high density, at the most affordable price point compared to 10 gig and 40 gig, and that's where the market will be going at some point. Thank you. Any questions? Any questions? <coughs> okay, then, uh, thank you for your speech. We have like